Okay, so it's it's nine oh six. Um, okay, and, and I know we're <laughs> exactly kind of what we're talking about the difficulty in uh, stopping the social socialization so the meeting can begin. Um, so it is it is on point, uh, but it's nine oh six. So we'll we'll start the formal part of this meeting, and I will point out once again that you have the ability to shut off your your video, uh, rename yourself into something more anonymous. Uh, and that the video portion of this that does get put up onto the internet, onto MassDP's YouTube site, uh, does uh, anonymize, it takes away any telephone numbers and, and names so that it's just the faces. So you have a lot of ability to, um, to uh, you know, retain your privacy to the extent that you want. Uh, having said all that, uh, we'll, uh, move into the meeting uh, another week. Uh, I We don't have any new Q&As uh, this week, so nothing specifically there to talk about. Uh, the two things that came came up for us, kind of big news in the week. Uh, one, we talk, have talked a little bit about, we're starting uh, site work with EPA down in Dartmouth on the Bliss Corner site, uh, getting EPA's mobile lab out there and sending um, samples as well to Chelmsford uh, to do PCB and metals work down there uh, to get a better handle on the extent of uh, the problem down in that, in that neighborhood. And so the good news is one, the work is, the field work is actually happening and that we're kind of trying to communicate with the uh, multilingual uh, neighborhood, uh, putting out the you know, instead of public meetings that we would normally be doing, trying to get as much information out in as many different languages as, as we can, as needed. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then the, the other kind of exciting news, uh, particularly for wayside cleanup, uh, has to do with the agreement that the Attorney General's office has made with the company that is now going to be cleaning up uh, and decommissioning and cleaning up the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. Um, you know, in in terms of kind of big waste site cleanup projects uh, that goes on, that this will be a big one. Um, and what we had to work out with them from the you know there are there are a lot of issues <laughs> that um, are involved in this agreement. Um, and but it does touch on waste site cleanup. And as with you, know, you take the nuclear power part away. Uh, and even without that, you're talking about a, a very large, old kind of industrial site that uh, most likely has had numerous releases over the years. Um, we certainly have been notified of a, a number of them, but as they start digging and decommissioning, um, you know, we don't, nobody knows what they're actually going to find. Uh, we have some ideas and they're going to be doing part of this agreement is to be doing a site-wide initial investigation that uh, would give some idea and, and identify uh, any reportable releases that are out there and then bring it through the MCP process. So it will be interesting to see how this uh, plays out uh, over the years. There are a lot of subplots and uh, interesting twists about kind of uh, decommissioning nuclear power plants. Uh, we do have, surprisingly, some experience in this. Uh, related to the decommissioning of the um, Yankee Row plant uh, several years ago. So it's, it's not learning as we go along, um, but everyone, everyone, meaning both of them, uh, are unique and uh, we'll see what happens. But that, that agreement uh, happened uh, like two days ago. So that's a fresh one and very exciting for us. Uh, well, I missed the very beginning of what you said. This is just for nuclear power plants or for all large industrial sites? No, th this is agreement for that nuclear power plant. Okay. Um, there, it's a, uh, as you can imagine, uh, kind of decommissioning a nuclear power plant involves many agencies, uh, many authorities. Uh, there's also, uh, interestingly, a the rate payers, uh, over the years have been paying into a fund. So there's actually a substantial amount of money that is specifically tagged for the decommissioning and cleanup of, of the plant. 
So the, the agreement kind of goes through all aspects of, of what has to happen, uh, in, including kind of what you have to look for for the oil and hazardous material, including the radiation waste, what the uh, goals and standards are, uh, how the money uh, can be spent, uh, all, you know, a variety of things, only some of which are waste site cleanup related. Uh, but it kind of reading through the agreement, you get an understanding of how, uh, certainly how complicated this will be, uh, particularly with the overlapping jurisdictions of federal and state agencies. Many years ago, I worked for Stone and Webster as a co-op when they were building nuclear power plants. So it was a while ago, pre, pre Three Mile Island. Yeah, wow. Uh, so that, that's our exciting news. Um, and in, as we were talking about before the meeting officially started, uh, no specific word yet on when uh, kind of DEP's progression back to into the office. I expect, as I've said before, that uh, in the next few weeks, we'll probably start seeing some additional flexibility in being, staff being able to go in uh, to the office, uh, mostly for grab and go runs, but, um, but also some limited ability to kind of work in the office where, uh, that work really needs to be done in the office. Um, but in the, the longer term, um, we're, we're probably going to continue doing what we're doing, uh, more, there's certainly more flexibility, uh, in staff going out and doing site work and doing inspections. Uh, we had some interesting conversations with EPA the other day on meeting our inspection targets uh, and <laughs> them meeting their own inspection targets. Um, where it's hard to do inspections if the companies are closed. Uh, so, so I think everybody is being uh, kind of recognizing the, the challenges as we move ahead and adjusting accordingly. So, that, that's pretty much all I have for, for news. If you have any questions or if you want to talk about kind of your experiences in the past week, anything interesting and new coming up, uh, any interesting challenges you're facing? Well, I would, Paul, actually. So on uh, the P TCE site I have in Waltham, um, we've, uh, I got news from the consultants I'm working with that uh, they've gotten back the access agreement letters. We have access agreements with all the residential property owners except one, and it looks like we may be asking for some assistance from the department on that, but I think we can probably work through that. So we had been thinking we would probably get that done by June, but um, to go in and do the residential sampling to see what the potential TCE exposure is um, has been a continuous source of discussion into and, and a look. I, is there some guidance I've missed? I don't know if, you know, the department, I think, has done some of that, but the sampling they did at our site was prior to all the lockdown stuff when they went in and tested one of the homes that they had access to. Um, but yeah, I mean, initially we were thinking, gosh, it's gonna be kind of scary if we put people in Tyvek suits with respirators and face masks and face shields and, you know, it's gonna be scary. I don't wanna do that. Um, but how do we do that required indoor air sampling to determine whether or not we have residential exposures? Well, uh, the extent of the sampling, Matt, uh, is, is it going in and dropping off a, a sumic canister and kind of going in, going out? Well, I think, yeah, I think, I think the idea was to do, you know, an, an overnight or 24 hour uh, sumic canister sampling plus grabbing some uh, additional samples when dropping off and picking up and running them by the HAP site mm -hmm. to try to get a picture, both a grab and a uh, composite picture, if you will. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, 
I, I've tried but just to... going into the home, right? Just going into someone's home, you know, the, the consulting firm is understandably, I think, concerned about potential liability should someone two weeks later develop symptoms. Yeah, I, I, so I've talked with the regional staff more about drinking water sampling for, for PFAS, where this is sure. recently for me. Um, and what I've heard that has been affected for them is, you know, it's basically talking with the homeowners and working that into the access agreement uh, and, you know, making, making sure that both the workers going in and the, the homeowners have that level of comfort. And, you know, it, it might depend on, you know, there are a variety of things with, you know, indoor air sampling might be a little bit more complicated than uh, drinking water sampling. Uh, I think we've seen the range of, uh, you know, some residents saying, okay, you know, as long as you guys wear masks, we'll, we'll wear masks and, you know, clean up and wipe anything you touch, you know, come in and do the sampling. Um, others have been more wary. Um, there are some circumstances where the, uh, the sampling could be done by the residents um, uh, rather than the, you know, having our staff go in and do it. So we're, I think we're seeing a, a wide range of things, but it comes down to communication with, with the homeowner uh, to see what they're comfortable with. I agree. And just one of the questions that's come up uh, on, on both sides from the company I'm working with, which is Sage Environmental and, um, and with and with one of the homeowners representatives is, you know, well, what, well, what does the department say? You know, what's DEP say about doing this? Is there any guidance that we can reference? And I have been unable to find any published guidance. It would seem applicable. I mean, we're basically saying, hey, at this point, we think we would need the full Tyvek and, you know, the, the, the suit up, people were contemplating the suit up that was being done at the pop-up testing sites, for example, the drive-through sites where the people are all in Tyvek's and yeah, face although, shields and stuff and saying, hey, I think we could probably do this with face masks, you know, wearing gloves, you know, people will wear yeah. gloves, will come in, you know, we'll try to, you know, if you have an exterior, door to the cellar we're trying to get to the basement so yeah. if we can go through without going through the living part of your the main part of your house that would be good you know we'll do that and I think people starting to feel a little comfortable but just they were asking if there was any regulatory guidance and I haven't been able to find any yeah I, I don't think we have any you know, written protocols for how we do it it's it we've been doing it on a case-by-case -case basis with whatever uh with okay. what motor is comfortable with uh, I don't think we've had cases where our, our staff or the contractors uh, were doing the full Tyvek suit thing. Okay. Uh, you, you can certainly see that in the testing sites where you know, the people that are, that are dressed up like that are seeing hundreds of sure. people during the day. Uh, but going in and doing, you know, taking one you know, or a couple of drinking water samples or you know, putting in the, uh, the air sampler, uh, yeah, they're in, they're out. I mean, quite frankly, and you might hear this on the um, on the audio. Uh, there's pounding going on upstairs. We have we have people coming in replacing a carpet in my wife's office, uh, continuing the conversion of it from our older son's bedroom into an office. Uh, you know, so you you it. I would view those workers similar to the way I would view uh, somebody coming and doing sampling. You know, you. You try to isolate agree. them. You you put on. Yeah, everybody wears masks if they're, and you clean up. Uh, anybody else have experiences doing you know sampling in people's homes lately? No. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, I, I do think people are probably getting a little bit more comfortable um, and, and, and almost welcome having uh, people come into the home, having uh, new people to talk to. Well, I think you're right, though, about is it any different than having some other repairman come into the house, which for the first time was a little disconcerting, but, you know, the air conditioning guy or you know, those type of service people came in, they had booties on, they had 
gloves and mask on and uh you know you're not in you know we stayed out of the house mm -hmm. when they were there but um yeah i mean actually probably coming in to do air sampling is going to be a cleaner person <laughs> physically than your average maintenance person i think it so. depends on who's in the home um and if there's a elderly people or immunocompromised i mean i'm with my 87 year old mother actually and i would not let anybody in our house yeah. with her around yeah uh, although it does it, it does make for an interesting you know, it, it's a hard decision for the for the homeowners because if you know, some of the uh the folks who would be sensitive subpopulations for for covid would also be sensitive might also be sensitive subpopulations for the contamination that we're concerned about um so for sure so it in, in that way it is different from having the carpet installed um and but it's some that's a decision that you know those the we have to respect that the homeowners you know they're, they're making that call and I, I think we need waste wayside cleanup and our staff would work to make sure that they're making an informed decision but if they if the conclusion is that that sampling has to be put off for another month or two then you know as long as we feel comfortable that they're making an informed decision we, you know, we're going to respect that so and you know if uh, i i would say if there comes a problem and, and matt you had said that you you might be coming to the department for access issues i mean that's one of the the ways that we would help would be to to uh, help make sure that the the homeowner is is informed and it, that if they have any questions about how those risks and balance uh, benefits would be you know could be weighed you know we can help them with that but you know at at the moment we're not going to where in some cases we might take a harder line uh, in getting access um, I, I think uh, certainly with this we um, we'd be working more the education and making sure people feel comfortable with it and see if there are options for, for doing it in a different way. Yeah, there really are, you know, a, a mix. Uh, I believe there is one with the uh, elderly resident couple, if I recall correctly, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, families with small children, or, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a neighborhood where there tend to be fairly high household populations. So mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about things like they're multi-story, you know, and when we come and arrange, you know, if there is no exterior, you know, please show us the quickest route, have only maybe one adult, keep everybody else upstairs. Um, you know, and, and we can't come in if you don't wear a mask. For example, I was going through guidance, you mentioned service people, and. I received a list for uh, another home saying, we're coming for your furnace cleaning, here are the rules. And you know, one of the first rules was, if you're not wearing a mask, we won't come in and your cleaning will have to be rescheduled. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm but, hiding you know. down here, I'm hiding down here in the basement and the carpet and soles are, are two floors up. So I'm not wearing a mask, but if I, if I were, to open the door and go up there, then you know I'd be wearing my mask. So, and well, thank you it, very it's much. Only, thank it's you only, only common much. sense. Uh, anybody else want to talk about experiences or what's going on? Okay. Well, if if not, we're approaching nine twenty-five. Uh, then we can we can end the formal part of the the office hours and we can get on to uh the informal part which would be the assignment for this week was uh films that are helping you get through the covid 19 lockdown anybody want to go first i'll go well, first of all, I thought part of the assignment was also what is your favorite movie, not necessarily what's getting you through COVID. So this is a picture from my favorite movie. I don't know if people can see that or know what movie that is. Is that James Dean? No, no that's The Great Escape. Ah. Exactly. But 
for years, they thought it was Steve McQueen. He all, did almost all his stunts. He did not do this stunt, and that didn't come out till after he died. But this is me doing my best Steve McQueen imitation when I was in college. <laughs> Mine's not that dramatic. To kill a mockingbird. There you go. Good man. And who, what, what uh, movie star made his screen debut in that movie? Did not, did not say a word. But had a Robert problem. Duvall. Exactly. Good for you. <laughs> I'm a wealth of useless knowledge. <laughs> That's why we like each other, Joel. And you, Paul, what's yours? Where are you on this? Uh, okay, well, so, you know, now I'm kind of embarrassed because you guys are being, uh, well, Larry's being far more serious, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least. Uh, let me, like, share my screen. Where'd it go? Ah, huh, that's weird. It's not showing up there. Buttons. Not that. Nope. Um, ha! Huh, that's weird. It's not showing up. Oh well. Um, the Invisible Man, isn't it? Yeah. That, that would have been, that Very would have been good. good. No, it, it would be. Um, oh, there it is. All right, there you go. This book is one of my, my favorite movies, and I think kind of, you know oddly weirdly uplifting and thus a good yes. way to get through uh COVID nineteen if I'm going to rewatch a movie then uh yeah I like it with a a, a fun if dark message. So Harold and Mod. No one no one's picking Outbreak as a favorite movie to get through this I take it. That was a hard choice. It was a hard choice. I mean you know, uh, the African Queen is one that's yeah. always been on the top of my list. And mm -hmm. and um, every time before we had streaming and all that, when I was growing up, um, every time the Seven Year Itch came on with Tom Rule and Marilyn Monroe, um, my father insisted on watching it. Um, so we always watch that, and that is one of my favorite movies. I think it was a really good movie. Um, but. You know, lately, our, so for our scout troop, our favorite movie is Moonrise Kingdom because they shot it at Camp Yagu in Rhode Island and some of our scouts got in as extras. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Oh, cool. So, yeah, that's a great movie. It is a great movie. So we thought. Anyway, that's a good scout movie. So. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, and I just was starting, so this week I saw an interesting movie. I don't know if I would classify it as the greatest movie of all time. But uh, and a surprisingly interesting movie that my son and I both liked, which was Dave Built a Maze. And it's on Netflix. And it has some very interesting, quirky pieces. So it was a, it was a surprise, a sleeper hit mm -hmm. in our little household. Uh, Diane, Diane Phillips had um, left us a message uh, that she had to leave uh, the, the meeting, but uh, she recently rewatched how to Survive a Plague, a <laughs> uh, 2012 documentary by David France at, about the AIDS crisis. Uh, some interesting footage of Dr. Fauci as a young guy. Really? So there's that. Um, okay, anybody else want to talk about their favorite movie or movie that's getting them through COVID? Do you remember the old Dustin Hoffman movie, The Andromeda Strain? Oh yeah. Where he it was another sort of outbreak where yep. people's blood was turning to sand and he had to figure out what was yeah. going on. By yeah. Michael Crichton. Yeah, Mike, one of the Michael Crichtons. I have a suggestion. Um, this is Linda Siegel. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. yep. Okay. Um, during the worst weeks of the current COVID crisis, when Governor Baker was asked, um, you know, does he have any good news? He recommended a film that we had just seen, which was The Biggest Little Farm. Um, and I don't know if you folks have seen it, but it's about a California couple who uh, decides to go and buy a farm and their struggle to be successful um, goes on for years. And it's very uplifting, actually. 
Oh, nice. Yeah. See, I'm Thank going for the that. uplifting movies. Hmm. Anybody else want to contribute? Hey, Joel, what, what do I got now? Since you're the expert in the old movies. You know, I've been sitting there trying to figure that out. Obviously, Spencer Tracy, I'm trying to think of what, uh, I, I can't place it. Oh, I like the old man in the sea with Spencer Tracy. That was yeah. But what was, what movie was that? It was Inherit the Wind. Ah. I don't know if I ever saw it. Oh, good movie. That, that was the first play I was ever in in high school. Really? Yeah. As a kind of, you know, background character. I might have been in the jury. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll draw this to an end, uh, but not before we figure out what we're going to do next week. Uh, I have two suggestions. One kind of... Uh, based on kind of the conversation before we started this today. Uh, uh, we could bring helpful hints and tips for technology and things uh, to help us get through COVID. Uh, or my non-technology thing uh, would be ideal vacation spots. You know, where would you go if you were able to travel with no limitations? Or where will you go? Where well, my ideal vacation spot. I'm still not going to go to. Yeah, I, I understand. Just through cost and time. Are, so so either one. You're either your ideal vacation spot or the one the closest you can get to your ideal that you actually. <laughs> Should we do that? Sure. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, have a good week. Uh, get some done. Take care. Thank all. you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.